So for those of you who have children, do you remember your baby's first smile? Have you ever thought what they were thinking as they smiled at you? For sure, they were letting you know that they are happy, but they were also reading your faces and responding to it. Facial expressions play a critical role in communicating our emotions to each other. And they do so for babies, too. When you're happy, they read it in your face, and they respond to it. They smile back at you. When you're sad or angry or afraid, they read that, too. They may frown, they may start crying, but they respond to that, too. So have you ever thought, as they read that emotional state in your faces, what is happening in their brain? How does their brain allow them to do that? How is their brain responding to your emotions? So this is the very question that our research hopes to answer. Faces are at the center of our social world. And before language develops, Babies really depend on their ability to read faces. This is their means of communicating. However, we know very little about what is happening in their brain and how their brain facilitates that function, which is really critical to survival. How do brain cells communicate with each other to, and talk to each other to allow this to happen. So we know very little about the baby brain. It's mostly a mystery, and we're, starting, we're now starting to understand a little bit about the communications between neurons that form early in life and change early in life. We know that we are born with a very large number of connections between brain areas and between neurons. And we know that some of these connections are redundant, some are weak, and some are unspecialized. And they change in a very profound way in the first few years of life. However, we know very little about how they change. How do these changes happen in the human infant brain? Why are we interested in that question? We're interested in that question because we would like to better understand, of course, brain development. And we are interested in identifying a blueprint of what constitutes the healthy baby brain's wiring in early life. And how does that wiring, how does that communication, that talk between neurons changes in the first few years of life? However, we're also interested to better understand neurodevelopmental disorders. Right now, autism, ADHD, are developmental disorders that are very heterogeneous. And in order to understand how they impact this wiring of the brain, we need a solid blueprint of the healthy baby brain. Only once we have that, we will be able to understand these disorders better and to develop strategies for early intervention to be able to either prevent or at least stop the brain from miswiring. Studying the infant brain is a very difficult task, even the healthy baby brain. The reason is that babies are exposed to a very unique experiences early in life, both positive 
and negative. And those experiences impact the way the brain wiring evolves in very, in very distinct ways. So although there are, every baby brain has common characteristics, the neural organization of the, of the brain is also very unique. I like the term that Rudy Tanzi used this morning, so I'll steal for, it, for, uh, for, for a second. He referred to it as the neural tapestry that makes us who, they are, who, who we are. And that's exactly what it is. It's a neural tapestry that is unique to us, that takes it about two decades to develop entirely, and be remains unique both in adulthood and in infancy. In addition, in infancy, the rate at which that circuitry, those brain networks develop, is also very unique. That makes it difficult to identify a common blueprint of the healthy baby brain. And to do so, we need to study a lot of babies. So with colleagues at Boston Children's Hospital, we are in a unique position to do that. This is a laboratory that uh, studies, that conducts large-scale um, experiments involving brains. So by using a technology that has been around for a long time, we're able to fit a cup of electrodes over their heads and record brain activity, the electrical activity of the brain, from thousands of neurons that are simultaneously active and talk to each other as babies perform tasks or are looking at their world. However, so the, the experiment that are conducted involves the, them sitting in their caregiver's lap and looking at faces human faces and animal faces, each with a different expression. Some are happy, some are angry, others are fearful, and we do that over and over and over again, and at the same time, record brain activity um, from a large number of electrodes. You can imagine that recording Electrical activity from the, from the baby brain, from 400 babies, from hundreds of electrodes, results in a very, very large uh, amount of data. It's enormous. It's an enormous amount of data. So, identifying patterns that are specific to the neural communication, to the talk between neurons as they respond specifically to emotional faces is a difficult task. So even in these very controlled experimental conditions, the baby brain is impacted and is getting activated not just by the faces, their mother's touch, the fact that they may be hungry, a toy in the room, the presence of the experimenter, a chair, all these may be activating their brains. So finding these, these patterns of activity that are specific to emotional face processing is a very difficult task. For me personally, it was also a very interesting challenge. I started my career in a completely different field. I studied underwater acoustics at MIT, and that's a branch of science that is, involves listening to our oceans and recording massive amounts of data from their sounds. And they, these sounds come from the movement of waves, from sea life, from icebergs, and even submarines. We then use this very novel big data analytic and computational tools in order to extract physically meaningful information from this, from this data. So I decided that we could use and we could translate these techniques into our study of the baby brain with a goal 
to extract from this data those patterns of electrical activity that are specific to the communication between uh, brain regions as they talk to each other and process information related to faces. So, here is a diagram of brain connections that are being activated as an infant, a five-month-old infant, is looking at a fearful face. On top, you have the front of the brain that is involved in many different functions, including attention. At the bottom, you have the back of the brain, which includes the area that processes visual information. And each line represents a connection between two points in space from which electrical activity was being recorded. On the right-hand side, you have the same diagram, but in addition, there are also the, more, the strongest connections that are being activated in response to that particular phase are also shown. As these babies age, these connections change. At seven months, maybe a little bit, but the changes are profound just by 12 months. You can see, without doing any statistics, just visually, that there is a much smaller number of connections that are being activated. Many of those connections that you saw before were probably redundant and have now been eliminated. So life is shaping up the brain, is training the brain to become faster and more efficient. So, these connections we were redundant or were weak or were unspecialized are now being trimmed. And this is a very exciting result. In the past, we have been able to track brain maturation in animals. This is a process that has been fairly well characterized. But it has been very difficult to do so in humans, and particularly in the intact brain. But using these novel tools, these big analytic, data analytic tools, we're now able to track these developmental changes in humans, too. And as a finding, it's very exciting to see how the brain, even in a period of seven months, is finding the most efficient routes, the more... Um, the faster routes, let's say, to transmit information from one point to another between its regions. So the second set of very exciting findings is what happens specifically to the brain as they look at different types of emotional faces. So when you're happy and you're smiling at your five-month-old baby, a set of connections become activated in response to that facial expression. And this is one of, the, of several networks that become activated um, in response to faces in general. An angry face has a little bit of a different response in the brain. There are a bit more connections that are being activated. But look what is happening when babies are looking at a fearful face, there are a lot more connections. A lot more, a lot more communication between large groups of neurons that are simultaneously active. And although by 12 months, you see that process of connection elimination and efficiency happening, you can see that the the fact that the fearful face activates a lot, more fa a lot more connections is still there. Fewer connections in response to happy faces, a lot more connections in response to fearful faces. Again, this is a very, very interesting finding. This Looking at what happens at five months is telling us that early in life, there are networks that are specialized 
to be able to process information re related to reading emotional faces. And these networks are sufficiently developed even at five months of life. In addition, fear activates a lot more connections, potentially another network that is also in place early in life. So, although at five months, our brains may not be wired to make complex decisions, they are sufficiently well-wired to be able to respond to fear and to be able to distinguish and process information related to facial expressions. This is really profound because it means that we are already, even whether it's at five months or at birth, probably earlier than five months, but we can't measure that so well, we are, our brains are already, although not yet developed, they are already well-wired to be able to perform functions that are critical to survival. So why is that exciting? Of course, it's exciting because we're now starting to understand what constitutes a blueprint of the healthy baby's brain wiring early in life. We, we are starting to understand that the brain develops very rapidly, connections are being eliminated, and the brain is becoming increasingly uh, efficient and fast. However, we're also beginning to put together the blueprint. So going back to the motivation of our work, being able to have this blueprint is a critical component to being able to understand developmental disorders. Only with this blueprint, we're going to be able to understand the heterogeneity of these disorders, the way they impact each brain affected by disorders in a very, potentially in a very unique way. And we have seen autism is a, a, a good example of a very heterogeneous disorder. So only with this blueprint, we will be able to do so. So in our quest to defeat these disorders, we are now establishing the, the backbone of this research and, to, and the blueprint that will allow us to do that. But finally, this work emphasizes that the baby brain, the way it's being shaped in the first few years of life, is impacted by their micro-world, but they, whatever surrounds them. And you are at the center of that world. So keep smiling at them. Thank you. Thank you.